Yeah. Hey, we're back. <laughs> we're back. <I'm> back. <laughs> we are back. Back again. Like a boomerang, like a yo-yo. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 37 of Carvers and Creators, a weekly demonstration and discussion with pumpkin carvers, sculptors, and multi-talented artists. We humbly ask you please consider giving us a like and a follow on the platform that you're watching us on. And please let us know in the comments where you're watching from and if you have any questions for the Carvers and our special guest. My name is Michael Mondragon. I'll be running the show, moderating and creating tonight. And I'll tell you about that in a few. Wait a minute. Oh. Wait a minute. What's today's date? I'm, I'm it's this back. Back. It, it, it is April Fool's, but it, but I, it, alas, it is not a joke. All right, all right. <laughs> <Made a joke. laughs> Let's meet the Carvers. First, he is an artist and sculptor from Boston, Massachusetts. He is a 2019 champion of Food Network's Outrageous Pumpkins. Paul Dever, welcome. Happy Thursday, oh. everybody. Hey, yeah. guys. Next, he is a multimedia sculpture artist from Tucson, Arizona, and a finalist on Halloween Wars 2019 on the Food Network, Matt Harper. Welcome. Maddie. Hey. <laughs> And our returning guest today is a Disney Imagineer, international speaker, and author. She's been in many TV shows, commercials, and films as an actress, artist, and puppeteer. From Southern California, Terry Hardin, welcome. Welcome, welcome Terry. Terry. Artist with an attitude. There you go. <laughs> Thanks Love for it. having me. It's great to be back. Oh, Always a pleasure. Yeah, yes, great yes, yes. Back. Now, Terry, I don't know if you saw last week's episode, um, but let me show you uh, some of the creations. Um, this was Matt's carving from uh, from last week. No, Matt, I, I already see you. I, so I love your darling. expression after I show it. <laughs> it is. It's really darling. It looks sort of Baby Yoda-ish. Well, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> our, our, goal, our goal in this was to make a, a pouting, youthful figure. So you had to be a, a young person of some sort and some you know, explainable way. So I'm not really good with youthful because I'm I love wrinkles and I love like you know squishy skin. So um but so and I wanted to have him look like he's welling up with tears and like just starting to cry. And you got so it. that was that was the yeah, I fought with that for a while on the on the eyes because it's you either make the line or you don't and yeah and I was trying to anyway but um that's what came up. So. I think you got it. I think I mean it's 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 really it's just really like I, I don't know how other people feel, but it makes you go, Aw. Oh, you come know. on, buddy. So. Come on, exactly. what's, the <laughs> what's got you so sad? I know I want to wipe it <laughs> tears, man. I want to wipe Thank the tears for it. It was tougher than I thought, right? Did it, 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 it was a little tougher than I imagined it was gonna yeah. be. Yeah. Kiss of death, right? The one the one you think makes the most sense is always the toughest one. Yeah, always. Well, Came well, out great. You're very though. right about smooth. Smooth can be very, very challenging. You know, yeah, very. And the wrinkles are more fun, and I always like to do like fifty gazillion teeth. I always yes. teach my students yeah. the teeth yeah. part because teeth are so fun. So you may be a dental hygienist after you do mm -hmm. it, but <laughs> right. <laughs> this one training. is adorable. This is Paul's. Mm -hmm. this yeah, is Paul's. you know what? This is if baby Huey wasn't a duck. That's how I feel Aww. about it. If he was just like a big giant. <laughs> Adult baby. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the kindest time getting that. It, I don't know. That, I got mad. Jowls. I felt the same way. Have you those guys? Have you, story. Paul, have yeah. you watched uh, uh, Peaky Blinders? Yes. Okay, so the, there's a character on there that is a big child that this is very, it looks like, I can't remember his name. I'm sure your audience, if they watch it, will remember. But he's, he's through all the seasons and he's just this joyful, sweet, uh, light-hearted individual that maybe is, you don't know if he's got a disability, if something happened, you know, but but he's just adorable and they keep him around because he's such a joyful. Oh, on the dock. Um, yeah, the dock. yeah, you know, yeah, go, yeah, get, go get flowers, go get this, go get that. And yeah, he's yeah, like, yeah. oh. Okay, you know, okay, you tell just, me. You just okay, love, tell and me. This, this reminds me of him. Yeah, that's cool. All right. yeah. I'll take that. I wish I had thought of that at the time. It would have made it for a better story. <laughs> <laughs> and then here, here's Dan's carving from last week. Uh, yeah, look at that. 
carves yeah. fast, man. He, he does. So he, he he nailed that during the show, pretty much. Yeah, it looks good. It looks like a superhero, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's got that hair. Hello, he's got these, I'm he, Troy McClure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> little boy hair. He got, you know, he's got the little parted. You know, mommy combed his hair. And now he's now he's angry, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah a, a, it's, a very young John Goodman. That's what I see. Uh, yeah, wow. there you go. Well, I you do know, too now. Yeah, that uh, you do see that in there, don't you? Yeah, yes, those are lovely. It. That's those all I can see now. That's, it's a very He's young, like, oh, John Goodman. Now I can see John Goodman. Oh man, yeah, you can't exactly. Yeah, you can't not <laughs> hold him. I can't unsee him. Arr. So, so Terry, I, I, oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 no. No, I'm first. Who are you? Hold on, ready? I'll make you talk. <laughs> yeah, okay, you go, and I'll interrupt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable mention to Christina on on last week's cards because she did she knocked it out of the park with her. So hats oh off God, to you. That was amazing. That was that was one of my that's probably my favorite that you've done so far that I've seen. I, really I, I concur. Chris, Christina, along. Along. If, you, if you haven't seen it and you haven't gone to her site, you, you know, or um, yeah, it was ridiculous. It was a cute little girl with a big with braids and or uh, pigtails. Mom ridiculous like yeah I'm like uh, I'm like why am I doing this why isn't she doing this you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, you do them together that's well, they're carving better. along with us right isn't that that's the right point? That's even better. yeah it's even better <laughs> yeah. do it together yeah she thanks thanks you for that for that plug yes um well Terry I I don't know if we had uh this uh guest this next guest uh now a, a permanent fixture of the show uh, when we did it last time, um, I'm not sure if we did it or not, but uh, are you familiar with The Wheel? No. Okay. So not this a is... Uh, not, not, I do not know The Wheel, you're, 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 a, you're a new guest here. Okay, wow. So you were on episode 25, so <laughs> we're 37. I'm not sure which one we started. Right. Um, but yeah, well, Paul, so Paul's going to tell you about the, the Wheel. Oh, well, Terry, say please. hello to my little friend. This is The, <laughs> the Wheel. wheel. Look how yes. cute that is. The center spinner, the, um, what Dan Danny had a name for it too. The Hello Wheel. The Hello Wheel, yeah. Hello, the, uh, Hello Wheel. I the don't Wheel see, of Doom, really. I don't see self-portrait on there. I guess you guys are okay. You're safe. <laughs> I think we took it off. I think, I, think we do I think we dodged the bullet there and did have it on there at one point and it got swapped out. <laughs> yes. See, yeah, you don't miss a beat. So we do, I mean, do we want to swap anything or we want to kind of roll the dice? We'll do a re or a respin if we hit the youthful. There we go. That's good. Okay. So, the first, yeah. so Terry, the first spin is going to be for the character that we're going to carve and the, the outside spin will be the emotion. Okay. So sounds that will, wonderful. That completes How clever. the character. And it kind of, Terry, it forces us into discomfort and that's yes. the beauty of the wheel. Yes. Or as I call it, panic mode. There you <laughs> go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's give it a spin. Last week I almost broke my elbow. Let me see if I can try it without it. An alien. Okay. Okay, okay. now let's see what kind of alien here. A maniacal alien. Hey, that Ooh. sounds like that would be fun. That, that would fun. be fun. Okay. That is a good one. It could have okay. been so much worse. If you're carving at home with us, like I know a bunch of you are, now's the time to get your tools. And if you've cheated correctly, you probably have something halfway carved and can get a jump on us. Yes. yes. So that's great. Or if you too. did something completely different, that's okay too. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> my as you're creating. Come on. This soaking baby is from Mars. Yeah. From Mars. <laughs> So we're going to give you uh, five minutes to get everything together. Meanwhile, we're going to go around and do our uh, ceremonial toast uh, to our creations tonight. Uh, before we do that, I actually am going to, I wanted to, I, I'm actually be participating today. Uh, okay. I figured because I'm, um, I, not that I have a lot of time and I'm trying to multitask doing all this stuff anyway, that, that theoretically I should be creating something. So I literally have my uh, drawing, uh, my sketch pad from literally the 90s. So oh, um, like I, I have all my uh, stuff that I've done. I even have, you know, drawings in here and stuff like that. Let me see if I have. I love the Rage Against the Machine sticker too. Yeah, oh, right. well, that's the thing. A, a, a Porno for Pyros and uh, Rage Against the Machine, uh, uh, an Arizona band called Trunk Federation. Um, but yeah, so like I have a whole bunch of stuff uh, that's in here. 
so a whole bunch, a whole bunch of wrestling it. stuff that I've done. Uh, but so I'm actually going to do a maniacal alien. I am. I have my got my pencils. Go ahead. Are you going to do it like a, a logo? Because I can, I can. I, I'm going to at least, I'm going to at least pencil great. something out. That would be a real. Because uh, think about it. What are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm going to go see the maniacal aliens down in the AHL. There hockey you go. Room. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Oh, guess who's playing tonight? Right maniacal right aliens are down. They're at the Troubadour. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the maniacal aliens. Second album. It's amazing. Doggone it! Those so maniacal stuff. aliens are in my fridge again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just that's, saw yeah, the that's fridge. The I gotta be in my house late night. Yeah, so I'll wind I'll wind up doing this, and I'll just make like a vector out of it. Um, so like oh, very that. cool. I can't believe I still have all this stuff in here. There we so. go. Your Mickey, we're going we're going to Hollywood. This is great. Okay. There you, there you go. go. So uh, let's start out with Terry. Terry, are you are you uh, do you have uh, anything uh, adult or our kids beverage tonight? What do you, uh, are you what are you, what are you drinking tonight? Adult or kids beverage? I have I have some tea today. Ooh, very. So I, which is funny because I don't know if you've seen the show Ted Lasso, but if you get the chance to see that, he hates tea, but I love tea. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Matt, so what you, do you got? You have a Long Island iced tea without the Long Island. I like that. That's oh. it. That's it for now. Yeah. That's a West yeah. Coast yeah. iced tea. <laughs> yeah. So I, I grabbed a, um, I'm not a really big IPA fan, but this one, this Voodoo Rangers. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've, we've seen that one. You, you can't go wrong. You can't go right. Yeah. It's, 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 it's plenty of fun. It's, What's that? It's good. It's good art. <laughs> it's really nice. That also kind of drew me to it. Is it kind of had that cool? Yes. Again, I wouldn't know yeah. who drew it, but. Do you remember cool when look. we when we had Griffin on the show? She was doing a pumpkin tribute to for them. Like they that's hired right. her to do the skull. I think that's right. I remember that. I think that's the only. That's the only reason I. That was the first time I actually heard of it. So. And Thank Griffin you. actually yeah. seems like the perfect person to be doing that, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right on her, yeah, that's in her wheelhouse. That's perfect. <laughs> you go, oh, yeah, uh-huh, yes, okay. yes. Yeah, that, that equates. Mm -hmm. Paula, what are you drinking? Well, sorry for the logo, but I'm going to go the opposite way. I do like IPAs, and this is a classic around here with the most simple logo that will never focus. There we go. And this is lunch from the main beer company. And uh, they have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Oh, my gosh. All three, three, yeah. So you get, I think it's a six, a seven, and an eight. So I'm going to go with lunch, and it's a 7%. Uh, they, I, don't have, I don't have that crazy IBU number you look for, Mickey, so I apologize. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they don't put it it's on there, delicious. right? It's a really good one. Just, just good let, one let, let me know if it's really hoppy, um, and I'll, I'll tell you the number. <laughs> oh, nice. How about you, Mac? Uh, you uh, I have actually from uh, I'm going through all my Arizona beers, Matt. Uh, this the is uh, the Devil's Ale from uh, Santan Brewing in Chandler, Arizona. Uh, it's just an uh, um, an American Pale Ale. Um, it, it's 5.5 uh, ABV, uh, t uh, 12 FLOZ. As, as oh, yeah, I know, I know you always, better. yeah, you, you, you like that one, Matt. Um, but yeah. yeah, this one, this one's good. One. The same as mine. That's crazy. Yeah, I love the logos. That's what yeah, I it's, for. With a really cool logo. They also have a one called the Moon Juice IPA, which is like um, a super cool uh, logo on it as well. I get, usually I get that when I go to Chase Field uh, for baseball. By the way, opening day today for baseball. Ah, so yeah, I yeah. know, right? Not around here. We got that's it. Up. Yes, I heard that. A little bit of rain in the morning, and everybody ran for cover. And then at two ten, when the first ball is supposed to be thrown out, the sun was shining. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's right. so this, this city's in an uproar. There's a lot of fans throwing their baseball gloves in the dirt right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's better than Washington. They actually got the the game got shut down for COVID. Mm. Oh, that's yeah, that's bad. See, yeah. that's not cool. You don't want yeah, that to happen. That's what that's we keep what, trying to it. tell people. You know, be smart so that we don't have to shut down again for you know. Exactly. Yep, we're getting close. Mm -hmm. I get mine next week. Congratulations. I th I thought, uh, aren't you in Texas? No, where are you, Paul? Paul's in Boston. Yeah, that's where I am. I'm in Texas. <laughs> You're in Texas. Boston, yeah, yeah. Texas. Boston, Boston, Texas. Boston, Texas. Hey, oh, you thought I said Austin. No, no, no. Yeah. It's Boston. Boston. Put the B in there. 
Yeah, that's the beginning. Tito's vodka from Austin to Boston. Well, <laughs> I'm excited that you get to have it. To have it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to hanging with you three tonight. So cheers, everybody. And everybody yeah. at home. Thank you so much. Cheers to everyone out there. Let us know what if you're to uh, enjoy anything out there and uh, if you're participating tonight. So the um, a maniacal alien. Very good. <laughs> maniacal alien. Who comes up with these words? Yeah, come on. Yeah, the dick no, right? Oh, you know what? I do have an... It, I, you, uh -oh. you know, we always complain about the shape of our... The butternuts it being that bell shape which is like an alien's head yeah so i think in this case it actually works out to, in my favor to save this young fella and swap it out with this fella hey hey all right look at the big brain on butternut <laughs> and I, I did the same thing paul i got i got a very i've got a couple different ones here i was going to start with this little fella but um but is this that guy the butt? It, they all seem to have butts i pick up you know once pick with a them up on butts on them. It's, it's Arizona, you know. I don't know what to tell you, but yeah, this guy's got a really long body, so he's a giant peanut. He'll he'll turn into a good alien. That's a good one, yeah. And Mickey's Maybe gonna I draw logo. Yeah. There we and go. Terry, I Terry. also know that you you have some artwork too that you wanted to share with everybody. Do you want to share that now, or do you want to wait? Well, whatever you guys want to do as you're setting up, just give me a holler and I'll okay. I'll start. You know, so you want to talk first, about it? Before, before uh, we wanted to mention, because, okay. you know, when we had you on last time, um, you were you were such a hit. And when I walked out uh, back up to uh, where my girlfriend is, and, and uh, actually she had contacted her brother as well, they went crazy about the dinosaurs, your association with dinosaurs. Hey. And uh, yeah, and they, they were just like, oh, my gosh, she was involved in that. Like, that was like uh, out of control. So, I mean... You have such a great pop culture uh, connection, and uh, you know, so like, my my this is more my girlfriend's era, but all like the Ghostbusters and stuff like that. I mean, that's when you know, and any, anything before that, Star Wars and all that, the original Star Wars and everything. So being influenced mm -hmm. by that is more my era. But yeah, it's like it, it, the stuff that that you're involved in is absolutely astounding. And, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, your, how, how you came about this. You were super passionate about it. But did you ever think in a million years that, you know, you would be here and doing all the things you're doing now uh, because of just do it, just being passionate at the beginning? Well, as a little kid, um, my mother, my mother and father, I think I may, I may have mentioned before, I'll mention it again. I'll pretend that I didn't mention much, but dinosaurs is one of my favorite things. And I never really thought that Disney was going to bring it back. I didn't think it was going to come back. I think there's a lot of us who have done these old shows that didn't think that it was going to come back. I mean, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air cast, they must have been like, whoo, what the heck, you know? <laughs> and so, and that was me with dinosaurs. I was like, yeah, wow. This is this is amazing that Disney Plus, but Disney was one of the people who up before the pandemic said we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna make our own, you know, streaming channel, Disney Plus. And so they were ready to go when we shut down, where a lot of people were a lot of other networks and things were scrambling. And then they were trying like crazy to dig up dead bodies to put on the screen. What do we got? What do we got to throw? Because there's no movie theater. Oh, my God. Eek, yeah, eek. Yeah. And Disney had already had a process. But then they started to think, wow, you know, we can pull some really super old shows, too. Let's dig up dinosaurs. I was just so thrilled when they did that. And yeah. I thought tonight when we were talking about the maniacal alien, I thought of when food goes bad, which is a fun episode in dinosaurs where <laughs> the food rebels and comes after the family. So it's a lot of fun. And, and uh, it's, it was, cr we, that's the beauty of dinosaurs was we were an ensemble group of about 20 puppeteers and performers. And we had our main characters, like I was team baby, but we also did side characters and background characters and filler characters. And then we would go to the studio and, and voice over various characters and stuff. We would, we had to be someone who did all these different kind of things. So I, I really, really enjoyed it. But when I was a little girl, 
I realized very early that I liked performing in front of people. And my mother tried to get me to, uh, she, you know, my daughter. So my mom says when I was a baby, she put me in the cart and she'd wheel me down the cereal aisle at the grocery store. And I would sing all the jingles. Or I would say all the statements, silly rabbit, tricks are for kids, you know, all this kind of stuff. And they'd go, my goodness, you know, my mom said they either thought you were talented or that you'd watch too much television. But <laughs> but she automatically saw that I was someone who loved to entertain and perform. So she she tried when I was a little kid to get me to, uh, you know, to audition me in front of people. But back then. They didn't want someone who looked like me. I looked, I looked mixed, and my hair stuck in out in every direction. I was this little mixed kid, white skin, blonde hair that went out, but it was my dad's uh, texture. My dad being black, my mother being white, and and so people were like, "What are you?" And we really don't want that on camera because it looks like your parents did something. And I remember as a little kid thinking, what, sent in cereal boxes, s &H <laughs> green stamps, what are you talking about, you know? But my mom was like, hmm, that's not working. So yeah. so my father, who my parents are, are my heroes, and they fell in love at the time. Rosa Parks was fighting for her, for the right to sit anywhere she wanted to on the bus. That's 1956 for those of you who are been born much later, which <laughs> makes me 63 and a half years old. Uh, 1957 was when I was born. And so at the time that I was being raised, uh, my parents had a bit of a dilemma. Everybody was like, you shouldn't get married. You're not thinking of the children. They're gonna be half breeds. They won't have any feet in any culture. And my parents just sort of didn't allow people to tell them, dictate to their lives. You know, my mother just fell in love with my father. And she said that when she saw my dad it, it, in, in college, he came around the corner and she said, I, I, I forgot where I was. <laughs> I forgot my name. And she says, Terry, I forgot I was engaged. So, okay. <laughs> so I could I could have been a McNutt, but uh, my mom quickly wrote to her fiance and said, you know, this isn't going to be the case. And she, one year later, yeah. she married my my dad, and she couldn't get married. They couldn't get married in California. They had to go to Mexico to oh get my married. God. And wow. uh, and there were still white drinking fountains and black drinking fountains. And I'm not talking about the color, I'm talking about the designated use <laughs> yeah. area, right? So here is a little girl playing in the park and she sees all the kids being lifted up. Don't know if I told this story before. Mm -hmm. Sees all the kids being lifted up, their fathers picking them up. So if you're listening to me or you're watching me, imagine you're, if you were a little kid and your dad picks you up because you can't quite reach the drinking fountain. And I saw this and I couldn't reach the drinking fountain. So I turned and I called to my father, dad, I, I'm thirsty. Would you pick me up? And uh, he didn't move. And I didn't understand why he didn't move. And I'm like, daddy, no, daddy, I, I'm thirsty. Come pick me up. And again, he didn't move. So he gestured for me to come over to him. And when I did, he put his arm around me and he said, um, we need to go home and get you a drink of water, you know? Uh, I'm on it. I can't do that, sweetheart. I can't, I can't do what they're doing. And he took me home. The idea was, and here was the situation. If my father had put his hands around me, a white child for all intensive purposes, I would looked white and my dad looking black. If he had put his hands around me and lifted me up over the drinking fountain, he could have been arrested or killed. So he so as a little girl, this was very hard for me to understand. I didn't understand it. I didn't get it. Why, you know, I'm your daughter, his own daughter. He can't pick up his daughter. Right. If we're in a park, he could not take me inside the bathroom. If you're parents, you know, you take your little kids in there to keep them safe. You know, you if it's a little girl, you holler into the bathroom and say, Father, bringing his daughter in, you know, or whatever. 
But in my case, I had to go in alone because if I was with my dad or if I was with my mother, everything was cool because she was white too. But this was the challenges that um, I faced as a little kid. Now, this could have gone a million different ways. My father could have been one of those who, who whined and moaned about the oppression of the black man or said, you know, this isn't fair, which he said. But he said the best way to live your life is to understand that poison isn't effective unless you take it. Oh. And I, I just, whoa, you know? So if someone calls you names and stuff, then is the offender successful? I don't think they are unless you take it in and react to it. So if you react differently, this is the way my dad said it. My dad said, you just be the best person. We just be the best people we are. Mm -hmm. And then they will understand there's nothing to fear. There's nothing to worry about. And you're still going to have bullies and all this kind of crap. But my parents told me I could do anything. I needed to understand that I could do anything, that I had the ability to decide what I wanted to do. I was going to be an actor and I was going to be an artist and I was going to do both. My mother was a watercolor artist and her parents pretty much, uh, they didn't beat it out of her physically, but emotionally they beat it out of her. She, she, they kept telling her that it was, there was no future in it, that she needed to get a real job, stop playing, stop having a hobby, stop being a child, stop being so selfish. And if this is what you all have been hearing, um, yeah. You need to rise up because I told my grandparents that I was going to be an actor, a performer. And my grandmother leaned right opposite my face, so close I could feel the spit from her talking, saying, <laughs> what makes you think you're so special? That's a one in a million opportunity. And I took a step back, looked her in the face and said, then I'll be that one in a million. So that's the kind of attitude I'd like you all to adopt because it's not right for someone to get in your face and tell you what you can and can't do, mm -hmm. especially when they don't know you. You know, I oh, mentioned I'm I mentioned this amazing show called Ted Lasso. I just saw that I, I'm a I am an actor and I am a puppeteer and I've done a lot of shows, but it was because every time I was knocked down, my father said, you have to prove to God that you're worthy. Not everybody gets to do this. So mm -hmm. are you going to lay down and cry? Or are you going to get up, dust yourself off and keep going? And I thought, I'll keep going. Yeah, I'll, I can do it. I, I, I can do that. So, so my career, I do look at, back at my career and go, who the heck is that girl? <laughs> 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 that girl has done all kinds of crazy stuff. And I can't even remember all the things that that girl's done. <clears throat> what, you, you're looking, what you're looking at now about, is from is a sorry, cosplay. Right this is a costume contest that I built this outfit for, and the puppet as well. What was your question? No, I just was going to ask because because uh, I think a lot of people that you know, like Paul and I probably agree with this. But when you say like you know just the, the naysayers or whatever, and especially the ones like I'm I'm a little older than Paul, and but when it comes to like when I first found a love for art was a really young age and I kind of had a beat into me that that's that's great you you, you go do that as a hobby but you got to get a family you got to do you know you got to do what's right for them you got to you know get a real job and do the right thing and I just followed that and I think in retrospect if I had done something different would I have been happier happier or, or I you know you, you can never tell but the, the the kind of the renaissance for me was like you know when I started carving pumpkins of all things right I was like this is what I've been missing. This is what I wanted to do. This is what I love to do. And it just kind of ignited that, that spark. And then in, you flash forward to 2020, meeting Paul doing this show, it's been kind of that, um, you know, I look forward to this more than anything during the week and tough week, you know, working quote unquote, but if, if I come to this, I can, I can at least have a great time and, and, um, and get it out of my system and just create and just, and, you know, kind of fall in love with the process again. And it's, you know, it's, it's, as much as it was the naysayers, you know, it was also kind of my brain saying, maybe it was just the culture I was in or something, but you, you, you can't do art as a, yeah, as a thing. You can't really just do that. Cause that's, that's just, that's just a pastime. 
And so, so today I've got a, a freshman in college in art school. I've got a, a second, my second, uh, my junior in high school, it wants to go to art school. And I'm, that's I'm cool. like over the moon about it where my parents would be like, yeah, that's cool. That's a good hobby, you know, but um, let's put, let's relegate it as a hobby. You go get a really good job first, you know. So well, this is the beauty of those generations. Okay. If you've been in your life, if you have gone down the road of, I've got to provide for my family and that's not art or I'm not an artist which let's just be clear on what an artist is. Don't I sound like Biden? Let's be clear. Um, <laughs> <Maybe too. laughs> don't say that. I keep saying, stop saying let's be clear. It's so annoying. Um, <laughs> leave that for the president. But the point is that I want to be clear as crystal in that an artist is someone who is passionate for what they do. They are not necessarily only painters, illustrators, pumpkin carvers, actors, singers. So when you say you're not an artist, I'm going to say, Au contraire, mon ami. I do not believe you. And the reason I don't believe you is because everybody has a passion for something. So just like my mother, Matt, my mother, it was, it was just drummed out of her. And as a result, it doesn't matter what paint I buy her, what lighting I do for her. She just can't seem to get past the brain, which is her greatest adversary. And for many of us, some of the people that are telling you you can't are your own selves. Mm -hmm. And you have to get past that. You have to tell that voice to shut the heck up. <laughs> and how do you do that? You get with people who say you've got this. I used to think, I don't know what I can teach people, but what I seem to have the ability of doing is if you're stuck, so let's use gunpowder, for example, when it gets wet, it doesn't fire. So if you have wet gunpowder powder on that heater, that's going to warm that up, hey, give you that spark and move you forward. I have this ability because I believe you can do it. I truly believe everyone can do it, whatever it may be. Okay, some people, you know, you've got to start thinking of yourself as an artist. Okay, so I have an amazing artist and she's an accountant. Her paint and her brushes are numbers, ledgers, mm. and documents. Mm. And I will tell you, she is so good at it. She dazzles me. She kind of reminds me of someone at a minority report where she just kind of <laughs> pulls it. I mean, it's phenomenal to watch her. Another person is she cleans houses. You know, she's like... Uh, I don't know if you'd say she's like a cleaning lady, right? Mm. But her knowledge in what to use to protect yourself, you can throw questions at this lady. I have this ailment, I'm having this problem, and she'll just come right up with, oh, well, do, you, do your products have blah, blah, blah? Because if your product has blah, 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 this could lead to da, 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 and then da, da, da. Oh. That's, that's another artist. <laughs> That's a Michelangelo of cleaning, a Michelangelo of accounting. You're mm -hmm. just using different tools. I like and that. I am not blowing smoke. I am absolutely dead serious. Yeah. I have a CPA who I call Jaws <laughs> because no one will cross him as far as taxes are concerned. He is <laughs> so good and knows everything so well. That people that the IRS is getting to the point if they see his name on it, they're like, oh no. Oh, forget it. Oh yeah. no. Oh no. <laughs> so so that's what I'm saying. There's lots of artists all over. Your talent may lie in another uh set of tools. But that it. doesn't mean that you can't dabble in what we're dabbling in. As you said, Matt, you wanted to take care of your family. And I always say, don't wake up tomorrow and say, I'm quitting my job and becoming an artist, especially if you have a family to feed. Right. Just start to add it like you would a spice in a good soup. Mm. Little bit, learn to do it. A little bit more. Get better. A little bit more. Better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, because we all know that there is a career in pumpkin sculpting. But it's not going to happen day one. They got to know who you are. You've got to build up that, you know, you have to build up a following or let people know this is what you want to do now. But it is extremely, uh, it's possible. It's possible. You can start in your town and it's possible. So, so basically that's, that's, that's my feeling. And my father, 
uh, helped me to realize, you know, I'm getting bullied, I'm getting beaten, I'm fighting for my life in elementary school because people don't like the way I look. And I can't change that. So I would come home, my clothes ripped and my face stained with tears and I'd go. And my mom would always say, well, you can hit them back, but they have to hit you first. And you would go, oh, okay, all right, I'll try and remember that. But <laughs> <laughs> but when there's a bunch of them, and back in the day, I mean, I can't imagine social media now when people are doing those horrible hate campaigns because no I didn't have that. I had no computers, and my phone right. was a murder weapon. It wasn't this lightweight computer that I now have, you know. But the point is this, all right, I come home at 11, I've had enough. I've absolutely had enough. My hair sticks out in every direction. I've had enough. And uh, and uh, I, I go to my mom and I say, I don't want to go to school anymore. I want to be Mary Tyler Moore, who was very big during my day. Yeah. I guess I guess now it would be, it mention anybody whose hair grows down naturally. <laughs> but, uh, but Mary Tyler Moore used to go into this cute little flip. And I kept saying, I just wanted to do that. And, um, and... Whoopi Goldberg does this great show where she puts a shirt on her head. When I first saw her, she put a shirt on her head and she said, look, this is my luxuriously long hair. I used to do the same doggone thing. Oh, wow. I think that's how we became friends. As I told her, I said, oh, my God, you know, I did this shirt thing because, as <sighs> you know, little, little, you know, African-American hair, black hair goes up. A lot of times it goes up. It takes a lot of things to make it not go up or you cut, you cut it close because of the texture there. So you do it because you love this flowing hair and you didn't have, you could have a comb to comb it and whatever. So I came to my dad and I said, dad, I just want my hair to grow down. And my dad, my dad said, I was sitting on the porch and my head, in my hands, I'm 11 years old. And my dad sits next to me and he sets that, lunchbox next to him the kind that had the thermos in the lid thermos yeah, being a yeah. big mm -hmm. thing with the red cup yeah. on top and it punched it punched in the lid and stuff yeah and he said i want you to close your eyes and i was like dad because you know as a kid this is really a vi this is major in your life it's not a kid thing it's not it's not this stuff that that you know your parents really have as a parent you have to understand this is a big deal to your child. You're getting beaten up and you're getting, and it's just, you're, you're, you're feeling like you're done. And my dad said, close your eyes. And then he said, I want you to imagine a rose. And I was like, dad, and he said, come on now. So I imagined a rose and he had me describe it. And I had a very favorite rose, uh, pink with dark pink edges. And he said, long stem or short stem. And I said, daddy, long stem. And he says, okay, hold on to that image. Got it? I said, yes. And he said, now I want you to look to your right. And now I was, we're still close. I, I didn't do anything. Look to your right. So I looked to my right. And then he said, look to your left. I looked to your left. He said, look behind you. Turn around. Keep your eyes closed. Look behind you. So I turned around and I looked behind me. And he said, everywhere you look. There's nothing but weeds as far as the eye can see hills and hills of golden weeds. I want you to plant that rose in the middle of those weeds. And I'm going to ask you one question. And this question is, do you want to be the rose or do you want to be one of the weeds? <laughs> My eyes flew open and I will tell you at a time when people were, were doing anything under peer pressure I never did because I said, I want to be the rose and uh, being a leader is a difficult path. It means you can't do what your peers are doing. So I would say, I'm not a sheep. I'm a leader. So people would say, you want to drop some LSD? You want to smoke a joint? You want to this? And no, because I'm a leader, you know, <laughs> and this is what I did. It, it, it protected me from through a lot of stuff. And I, I, many people say I'm fearless. Basically, I guess I just don't let people see me sweat, and I don't. I don't think you should either. I think every accomplishment is because I walk through the door of opportunity. 
Okay. I just walk through it and people go, where do you get it? Like, like, so, you know, you see this and you don't know how to do it, but you've said several times, you just took the job, figured out later. So true about yeah. me. It's yeah. my whole life. Yeah. So, on my so fake, it to, fake it to the make it till you make it thing is so beautiful. It's like yeah, I think everybody with except for pilots and doctors are, are pretty much know that. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of people that that think, oh no 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 that's too scary for me that's too scary for me, you know. But my dad was the first black phone man in Hollywood, California, ever to be oh, wow. hired. Wow. And they warned him he would have adversity. There would be people who didn't like that, and he would. My dad was like. And they okay. said, just, just, just be as cool as you can. And my dad was like, okay. So my dad put in phones for Jerry Lewis and he watched it. He put in things for the Academy Awards and he did all this cool stuff. And, uh, and one day he was at a radio station called KMPC radio. And he was sitting on the floor running lines because back in the day you ran these wires up oh, through yeah. the floors sure. so that the murder weapons better known as the phones, uh, could be used. And, um, and so he was sitting on the floor when he's approached by five white guys, four white guys. So four white guys walking down the hall, my dad's sitting on the floor, and then they tower over him and look down. Now, what you may be thinking is, uh-oh. But my father said, hmm, this is interesting, in his head, never did speak it. Hi, guys, what you need? And they were like, Richard, my dad said, yes. And they said, uh, you ever thought of going into radio? And my dad was like, radio? And I said, yeah. Uh, and my dad was like, no. And, and they said, would you like to go into radio? And my dad was like, I don't know. And they said, well, what if we taught you? What if we told you you could come into radio and we'll teach you everything you know? We'll send you to school. We'll pay for everything. Would you be interested? And my dad said, sure. And they said, okay, we're going to set it up. And they started to leave. And my dad said, wait a minute, why me? And they they looked down and they they shuffled their feet. And they, well, here's the thing. We need to hire a black guy and you're the only one we know. <laughs> <laughs> right place, right time. So my father said, so that's what I know. When I did the Dragon's Lair for Disneyland Paris, when I did the Dragon Underneath, I had never designed an attraction ever. I just said, I love dragons and I know what I want to feel when I get in front of the dragon. So I will create this attraction so that people will really feel it. Hmm. And, uh, and it was just one of the best opportunities. You know, Ghostbusters, when Ghostbusters said, can the dog that Sigourney Weaver turns into, do you think it'll be more feminine if you do it? Yes. Sure will. <laughs> Did I know that? I didn't know that. But I said, yes, of course, of course. It's so you know? awesome. You know, yeah. Terry, you've been, you've been uh, branching out yourself. I know you, you're, like Mickey said, you're, from the puppets to, to, to uh, now I understand there's a painting element that we, uh, we touched on before the show, but I am fascinated by this process. Um, and it's a it's a very scary medium. I I there's a few mediums that that frighten me. I, I like kind of do trying everything, but but yeah. paint, painting, like yes. two dimensional oil acrylic painting, is one of those things where I know that there's a process and that, but I just have a innate fear, and I'm just in awe of so many really great painters. I'd love to hear your little journey through it because I know what I what mm -hmm. I got a chance to see that our our friends who are watching will get a chance in a minute, but. Um, it just like blew my mind. I'm like, what? First, yeah. what? So anyway, I'd love to hear about it. I used to tell people I don't draw that well. I don't, I have never painted because, you know, it's two dimensional and I like to sculpt. I like to create what I see. Three dimensionals. Yeah. If you got to sculpt the back, you turn it around, you sculpt the back. You know, <laughs> trying to put it on a flat surface to me was ridiculous. I might, I thought people who do it, they're amazing because I don't see myself doing it. So I'm with you on yep. that, Matt. But then we get this thing called the pandemic and I always try something new, but the pandemic gives you an excuse. I mean, you could sit and binge watch your favorite shows, but many people complained they were bored with that. And I was like, well, why not try something new? Yeah. But I kept saying, try something new. And I was kind of dabbling here and there. And finally I said, you know what? I need to put my money where my mouth is. Let's do it. Lead from the front, 
let's try something new. Love it. So my husband got me these amazing paints and they're acrylic paints and I had no idea how to use them. So I decided to do it. Now I had originally, okay. So just to give you an idea of what I do do, this is right here. I wonder if I should do it sideways. Yeah. So this, these, are, these are amazing, by the way. This is like yeah, my childhood so, in, in a statue. You know? So these are what I do. I sculpt these things for Disney and I sculpt these things for collectors. And collectors can buy these from me. These are little sculptures called impressions. This is what I do. I do my impression of things that people ask and create. Okay. And I always do it in three dimensions. So then I also do these retreats where you can come and learn how to make a living doing what you love. Because I learned that there's a lot of people who just don't know how to take it to that next step. They're kind of dog paneling and they want to learn how to make money at what they do. And I have made money as an artist since I was eight years old. I never understood broke artists because it, it didn't happen for me. <laughs> you know, I didn't buy that book. People are like, oh, don't be an artist. I'm afraid of the artists because they're always broke. Well, I decided to leave that book on the shelf. Good idea. Okay, just just don't take that book down and open it and read it. Just leave it up there. You've got a lot of other good books. So, so I started sculpting like a crazy person, and I've done some amazing pieces for some amazing people. But now this painting thing happened, and I did this retreat, and I, my friend Janny wanted to uh, be a teacher, so I brought her down to my retreat. It's only 10 people. And we, we spend the weekend together and we break bread and we cook and we have the evenings together and we go on hikes. And then we also create and brainstorm about how they can make a living doing what they love. I only do two a year. And of course I got shut down during the pandemic, but I brought her to teach, to show me how to paint. This is the only painting I had done in acrylics before, oh. <laughs> before the new one. It's really quick. Jenny does, uh, uh, she works with recycled materials. So here's this little thing up here and okay. there's some, some paint going through on the sides to make this pattern. And then she's got the Scrabble things here. And then this is my dog. So I thought that was cute. Okay, that's adorable. That's cute, yay. But <laughs> I said, I really wanna do a painting. So I went and I took a class and I will show you the end result, and then we'll talk about the process because yes, y'all wanted to do the process. So right here is the uh, finish. This is my very first painting, and I decided to do a self-portrait so I wouldn't complain if it didn't look like me. <laughs> so <laughs> awesome! Oh no, that is insane. That is amazing. And, and, I, and I and I'm very proud of it because it looks like it's painted. It's painterly. Yeah. Um, yeah. The teacher taught us how to do long black hair, and it was in the video, but she never came on to talk to us about what we might do if we had hair like this, so I had to kind of guess, <laughs> but that's okay. No problem. I'll guess, but basically, it was a lot of fun, but as I said before, here I am. I'm nervous about it. Oh, thank you. You're so sweet. You are absolutely so sweet. I, 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 it's, 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 I just was so excited that it looked like me. And I was like, okay, that's all I wanted. Good. And now I'm ready to do another one. But the way the teacher works is that she works from the ins, from the, from the drawing stage. So she has you do a sketch. Many artists will have you do this. They'll have you do a sketch first. And then you paint each of the elements. And then at the end, you sort of bring them all together. So here is the first element that I had to paint, which was the eye. Okay. So there's oh. the sketch on the canvas. We've backed it with a neutral color. I chose gray. I'll talk to you about why that might not be a good idea, you know, later. Okay. But, uh, but the point was we did the eye. She gave us a couple of days to do the eye. And she wasn't there. So the video gave us a couple of days, not her. But then you do two <laughs> eyes. And you'll notice with the reference photo that the T between the eyes and on the forehead is very light at this stage. But I didn't worry about that, okay? Because I want to keep going to see, you know, how far I can get and then we'll, we'll fix it later. So here is one where I'm a little bit further along. And, it, and I had trouble with that gray 
on my forehead. I kept saying to myself, this is a problem because it looks like I have a hole in my head. So I went ahead and filled it with just some color. Didn't again worry about what it looked like or how it was. I just filled it with some color mm. and said, you know, I'm, I'm a beginner I, and and embrace your beginnerness. You know, mm. I, I don't want to stress about it. Here's a couple of others where where now and you notice how it's just radiating out from that eye is the way this teacher teaches you. It's a lot like how I draw, honestly. But I don't know if this is gonna be my style. To be honest with all of you who are watching, this may or may not be my style. So I'm gonna show you this one because now I'm working on the hair. But I had a problem with this because the gray background, uh, when I painted my hair gray, it looked like I hadn't painted it because it was too close to the gray background. Oh, oh. So okay. I was really having a challenge with that. So I said, okay, I don't like that. So I need to put something in the background. I don't care what, but it's got to be something. So I came up with this and uh, I did this green and I said, that is good for now. Just, just so I can get the hair to feel more like dreadlocks. Again, you notice that there's a lot more highlights in the picture than there are in the painting. And this is where you guys, as, a, as an artist, can kind of decide, hey, you know, what is it I want? What is it I like? And so at the final time, I did that. So you can see there's more highlights in there. You can see that I've changed the background mm -hmm. because I just wanted something a little more... Uh, Rembrandty, if you will, one of my favorite artists, and uh, and and I did it, and I I'm excited. It looks like me, and I'm excited that it has, you know, I mean, it's acrylics. I was never able to work well in acrylics, and now I I feel better about it. So I'm eager uh, to find a teacher that uh, uh, that can help move me forward. And because after doing that class, I found there were things that were missing with that instructor. So I said, for one thing, it was a video course and the instructor never came <laughs> to speak with us. So so I, I didn't need her to speak with me, but I just can't imagine you're a teacher and you, you, you put the kids in the, you put everybody in a classroom and then you just don't show up to class. Okay. You're going to have all these days right. to paint, but your students are all going to talk. That's kind of what it is. If it was in, if it was live, you know, no one would stand for that. So even you, so she 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 is not is not someone I would continue to learn from. But uh, she got me off the blocks, and I'm grateful for that. And she made it so that I want to paint again. So I'm grateful for that. But there were a lot of students who just felt lost, and and uh, we tried yeah, think, to help, but you know. And I don't I, I don't know if you've noticed this too, but like with 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 everything being virtual, you know, you guarantee you if you were sitting in a studio with them, it'd be a world different experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, and I know that there's, um, I think, Paul, you talked about that Ferrat, Ferro. Um, oh, Philippe, Philippe Ferro. Ferro. He's like this amazing sculptor that, that for God's sake, I've, I've like drooled over his stuff for years. And he, he was coming through and the most close, the closest one was in California and NorCal. I'm like, you know what? I can make that work. And then, of course, the pandemic hurt, hit. But so he's got like online versions of it. But um I, I know that there's probably a big learning curve when it comes to like doing it virtually to doing it in person. Cause I'm sure in person, you'd just be like, you know, having their in. I, and, and the reason I mentioned this is I had a chance um, shoot, when was it? Um, five, six years ago. Um, um, when, when was it? Yeah. Um, uh, Ray Villafane had a, a like a, a, a half day class. And I'm like, I'm going to go do it. So I drove up to Phoenix and spent, and it was one of those things where I, I was a real novice. I just started doing this and, and, you know, it was really cool to have the, the in-person thing. And I think that's quite different, obviously, than, um, than you're going to get, uh, you know, online. Hopefully, hopefully that improves, but I love that. I love that you still want to keep doing it and find the next teacher and keep blowing it out because this you, you keep can't stop after seeing what i saw well, and you can teach online okay you can teach online and you can make your students feel good yes it would be great if you were over them so you could because i usually when i'm teaching someone pumpkin sculpting i take their hand so that they can feel i hold their hand in mine so that they can feel what it's like to take mm. the tool across your your squash or your pumpkin i can't do that virtually 
Right. Uh, I did vir a live virtual pumpkin classes last year. And uh, uh, honestly, they were good. I had a good group of students and I had one guy who was in New York and, it, and it, his pumpkin was frozen and he was trying to carve it. For the best. <laughs> he was such a sweet fella. But he just stood there and I said, well, you do the best you can and then thaw it out, a let it thaw itself out a little bit. And then if you have any questions, this is me and Tippy Hedron. I do a lot of charities. I love to sculpt for charity. I love to do stuff for charity. I'm a, oh my I'm a, God. I think a charity that. fan. So this is Tippy Hedron from The Birds, one of my favorite oh, uh, Hitchcock yeah. films. Tippy, don't go. No. You know, I love suspense. <laughs> So, I, you know, I must have seen this movie a hundred times. And anytime she wakes up, I go, no, Dippy, don't do it. Don't do you it. Know, I'm yelling at her all the time, you know, and I think that's what, what makes a good movie. But my point is, in this virtual class, the teacher has to be present. Yeah. In other okay. words, you know, you can make a video course. And I've got a lot of people who want to see a puppet class, want me to show puppets because I've been a Muppet, been with the Muppets for so long. Mm -hmm. They want to know sculpting. And I know every, I know so many different clays because as an Imagineer, all I had to do was pick up the phone and say, I'm interested in this clay. And the truck would back up and they'd dump oh. it over, you know. <laughs> I want your that. endorsement. I just want your endorsement. I want your endorsement, Miss Disney girl. And yeah. I would be like, <laughs> okay. And I would learn these clays and 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 I talk a lot on my on my Facebook lives about the different clays as I show some of the pieces. So so basically, uh, uh, it, that's the thing that is so is so great is that I'll learn all of these. I can teach so many different things: drawing, sketching, all this stuff, and I teach it in a way that people will do it over. So. And, and I say this because I don't want you to feel like you're not good. So I want you, I want to give you the best opportunity to succeed as I possibly can. And so when I, and that's why I was learning about these video courses, because I want to record a video course, but I want to be present right. enough that you can ask questions of me. You know, it's not live, but you want the ability to, you know, come in and say, Hey, you know, I'm having a little trouble here and be answered and responded oh, to, you, you know, you. you want that middle so that the person it knows you're there should they run into any kind of challenge or trouble. Got it. But most yeah. of the time, I think an artist who knows what they're doing tends to get a little bit too stuck on uh, symmetry, which incidentally, there is no symmetry in nature, by the way, um, except for you have two eyes and two nostrils and et cetera. Okay. But if you look <laughs> at yourself, it's not the same, just so you know. Um, and then, and then they worry too much about symmetry. They worry too much about making it look like what it's supposed to look like, et cetera, et cetera. And honestly, what I want to do is have you tell me, do you, is your goal to be a professional at this or you just want to experience right now? And that was right. my attitude with the painting. I don't know if I want to be a professional painter yet. I'm just starting out. I just want my paints to to look like something other than, you know, Jackson Pollock sneezing on the canvas. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, that's what I want. I want to be able to recognize it and I want to be able to enjoy it. And and so that was my criteria. And that's the criteria I have for people who, who learn how to sculpt from me. I show you how to sculpt and you will be successful because I'm going to teach you a way to make something the way you make it. Okay. Not the way I make it. We don't use calipers in my beginning classes. We don't take measurements because there's something about you putting yourself into the art that I, I think that. is extremely important. Just let your style develop. And if I confine you too much, this is why this particular way I did it, one eye, two eye, nose, mouth, is a little tight for me painting wise. So I'm finding another teacher where he's just going to paint the whole painting and then take the whole painting to the oh, final. Okay. okay. So you're kind of. That's the way we sculpt. I mean, Paul, Paul and I will yeah. tell you. That's, I mean, it's like, oh, wait, there's something over here. Oh, oh, wait, wait, there's something here. I, oh, wait, there, there, I got to go over here. It's like, 
I, I, I would have a lot of trouble finishing an eye and then going to the, oh man, that would be, that would drive me nuts. Exactly. Exactly. And so some people do it so well. Like I have a teacher who says I do a really explicit drawing and then pretty much I fill in the colors. His paintings mm. are beautiful. That's his style. Yay. Yeah. Good but for him. the point is you'll find your <laughs> style if you try different ones and kind of see where it is. Yeah, a lot it. of the things that I find very sad to me are if you've been a Disney artist for 18, 20 years, and then you start to do your own art, people go, wow, that looks like, and they name a Disney legend. Oh. So, oh, his art looks like Mark Davis. His art looks like, you know, his art looks like, you know, Herbie Ryman. His art looks like, uh. you know, and, and what's sad about that is that you don't want, oh, maybe you do, and yay for you if that's what if that's your goal. But <laughs> when I got out of Disney, I had to unlearn all that I had done for Disney because I'm so accurate with Disney when I got out. Now I do my impressions of it, not, oh, I love it. you know, because as a Dis when I was under the Disney as an employee, I had to duplicate what they needed. Mickey Mouse had to look like Mickey Mouse. Thank goodness right. I never had to make Mickey Mouse. But the point is, is that whatever I created had to look like what it was supposed to be. Yeah. And it had to be symmetrical because it was having anim animatronics going into it, which is really a twitchy thing because like I said, nature is not symmetrical, but I had to make it symmetrical so that the mechanics didn't have to worry about things moving weird. So those are the things you learn if you're a professional, but if you're just wanting to sculpt to sculpt, paint to paint, do art for art, I don't want to be the barrier that makes you stop. Right. Did, did you have that same kind of um, constraints at, at Henson or in the movies or, I mean, cause I know that, you know, Disney's Disney and I get that. But when you were given kind of a, a blank slate, did you find yourself kind of being more, hey, I'm going to go create my thing and just, and, you know, tweak it? Um, like at Henson, was it a little bit more guard, guardrails, but not as much as Disney? Or, was, or did you find the same thing happening? Well, here's the thing with Jim Henson, okay? I meet Jim Henson in 1982. People go, don't name dates. But I'm going to name <laughs> dates, Okay. I met Jim Henson in 1982 in New York after doing a Chicken McNugget commercial. For those of you who are old enough, and you can probably Google it on YouTube, but we used to sculpt the little Chicken McNuggets that danced around. We sculpted them, and then they were puppets. Then they became computer generated, and then of course, they're no longer. But in, uh -huh. for the longest time, they were dancing little puppets, and we would perform them, you know? And, uh, and I was flown to New York to do a commercial. And to make a long story short, there was a free evening and a couple of days free after we finished. And my my mentor and puppeteer wanted to go to the Met, to the opera, and all the other puppeteers had mysteriously disappeared. And I all of a sudden was sort of standing there alone. So he said, let's go to the Met and watch opera. Well, I didn't ever see opera. I'm super young. I'm like, I don't even know if I'm going to like it. And I said, but what do I get? And he said, what do you want? And I said, I want to go see Jim Henson Studios. Oh. And he said, which is called Ha in New York. And he said, you're not going to meet Jim. And I said, I don't want to meet Jim, which is a true story. I wanted to find out how they made Miss Piggy. <laughs> because I had been building puppets. I had been building puppets since I was about 15 years old. And I wanted to know, I couldn't figure out how they built Miss Piggy. I knew how to build a Kermit. I knew how to build Fozzie. I could not figure out Miss Piggy. I could not figure out uh, Bunsen. How about Gonzo? <laughs> or Gonzo. You know, I, I, but I could have gotten by with Gonzo. I might not have made it the way they made it, but I could have done that. But Piggy... <laughs> There was no seam. She was smooth. She was beautiful. Yeah, beautiful, exactly. So he said, okay, well, when I went to Hanson Studios, Jim was there. He wasn't supposed to be there, but he was there. Oh. I teach this technique, too. So the idea is to teach people this technique that once you do this, you won't go back. This oh is God. the magic mirror. I'm doing a magic mirror puppet from oh, cool. Snow White. What the so hell? This is, this is the face for the magic mirror puppet. But anyway, so... Jim sees me. Well, he automatically wants to know who I am because I'm a woman. Now, many women out there will be like, well, what do you mean by that? But back in that day, back in those days, there was three women to every 30 male puppeteers. Oh. 
And the only reason we were ever cast at the time was because they needed female voices. So that was a drag. And again, you can be upset about it or you can just say, well, I'm going to change that in the New York Minute. And so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to change it by being really good at what I did. And Jim saw me and he knew because I of who I was with, Tony Urbano, um, that I was good because Tony wouldn't be in the company of someone who wasn't. So he, he, he wanted to know all about me. He, he stood in front of me and he started to fire questions at me. How long have you been a puppeteer? Blah, 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 blah. And Tony stood between us and said, she's with me. Stop it. And I, and I pushed Tony out of the way and said, no, I'm not. You know, um, I wanted to, I, you know, I wasn't going to lose this opportunity to talk with Jim. And Jim said, well, why are you here today? I said, I'm also a builder and I want to see how do you make Miss Piggy? So he personally took us down there and showed me how he made Miss Piggy. And it's a oh flocking, it's a electrostatic flocking technique. Many people have you seen behind the scenes. It, it looks like a big uh, heat thing with foil on it and they shake it and it makes the little hairs glues oh, on is, end yeah. to a glue covered foam sculpted Miss Piggy. And that's how she gets all that soft look. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. I was so excited. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to go home and try this, but I'm, I'm bedazzled by it. And a couple of weeks later, Jim called me and uh, asked me if I'd come to New York. And I told him no. <laughs> so pick your mouth off, off the floor. Yes, I did. Yeah. I told him no, <laughs> because I, I could not live in Manhattan. It was too noisy. I was too, I just wasn't comfortable there. It was just too much uh, sensory overload. And I said, I can't really do a good performance. And Jim said, well, what makes you think you can work for me if you don't come to New York? And I said, Dave Goals, who does Gonzo, he lives up north in California. And Steve Whitmar Meyer lives in uh, Baltimore. And Kevin Clash lives in Atlantic. And he's like, okay, okay, you've done your homework. I said, <laughs> of course I've done my homework. So long story short, with to answer your question, and I know this is a long way around, but let me just, <laughs> just now bring it all in, as they say. With Jim... He was so excited about me. He was in New York, and I didn't realize he was excited about me. But in 1989, Disney, he sold Muppets, and he came out to do Muppet 3D Theater, which you can still see in Walt Disney World, Florida. Mm. And I, that was the first thing I did performance-wise with Jim Henson. But during the audition, uh, one of the things he said was, you're coming to audition, and if you suck, I'm really going to give you trouble. And I said, bring it on. And so, but after that, he said, bring your portfolio. I want to look at it. So when he passed away, we were designing a show that I had created from characters I had created. He fell in love with those characters after seeing my portfolio and said, I want to do a show with those. So that was a golden opportunity to sit with mm. Jim Henson and create wow. this show that has never seen the light of day. I may bring it back because it's mine. But oh, the good. thing yeah it's mine so so and that was the cool thing about jim is in the in the in the blue sky phase as they say at disney when you're kind of brainstorming he would kind of just leave it to be mine you know because he didn't know if he was going to take it but he said if it if it gets to a certain point we'll we'll be official and i was like okay and then unfortunately he passed away which uh. was which was sad but that means i could do it if i wanted to that was great that was creative now let's go to being hired by the Henson Company to do dinosaurs. And we auditioned on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle puppets. Oh. <laughs> so you're automatically intimidated because there are the Ninja Turtles right in front of you. And you're like, oh, my God, these things are amazing. <laughs> and I don't know how you make them move. And now I've got to learn how you make them move because I'm a puppeteer like this, not a puppeteer like this. And uh, wow, I mean, oh my goodness, my, my, my little heart went pity pat and I, I, I was really nervous. I didn't think Jim had mentioned me to anybody. And all of a sudden I found out that not only had he, uh, not only had he mentioned me to somebody, but uh, uh, he had told him, you know, this girl is someone you, you want to have. I'm looking to see if I have a particular picture I can show you. I may not have put it in my my favorites. So I, I did. I I love doing puppets because uh, I do a thing called the Foster Farms Chickens and oh, the yeah. Foster Farms Chickens. Yeah. <clears throat> we um, love those. 
were yeah. mine. I mean, well, I mean, the guy I designed them for at first tried to put the thumb screws to me and make me not do it. But then they liked it and they said, this is what we want. So I got to do what I what I wanted to do. And I'm very excited about that. So that happened. But at Henson, there were ways you did stuff and there were ways you don't do stuff. Okay. And um, there I am. Yeah. We're wearing green here because that's erased later. That's uh, taken out. But this is us with our vision goggles. You can actually see what the camera sees with the goggles. That's cool. And uh, it's a lot of fun. And the guy next to me is Drew Massey. He plays the driver bird, the bird that drives. And then we have people who make the wings work. We call them wingmen. Oh. They make the, the do the hand gestures. So it's always a team with puppeteers. It's always a team. But they, do, Henson had a way to do it. So Brian Henson came to me and said, you either build or you perform. I don't want you doing both. So did I get to do what I want? He heck no, because I build uh -huh. and I perform. So now if I want to work for Henson, I have to make a decision. Oh. Am I going to build or am I going to perform? And I said, I'm going to perform. And he said, I was glad you said you're going to perform. Good. There were times when I was so terrified performing because it doesn't go away, guys. You never know if you can do it. And I was originally cast as Charlene. I was going to be Charlene Sinclair. I was going to be the puppeteer for Charlene. So the way the big one works is you program the head like you would an, a radio control. It's done by radio control like airplanes and, and remote control cars. But it's a lot more obviously involved, these heads of the Ninja Turtles and of the dinosaurs, etc. But we had a system called the Big One, and it's a joystick. Many of you are familiar with that if you play video games. And then there's a thing called the Waldo, which opens and closes like this, okay? So when you manipulate the mouth of the character like a puppet, you are actually in a unit on a box that helps you to help it to talk like this by pushing the the joystick forward back sideways or rolling it in between based on how you free program expression so i would program forward being happy back being sad left being angry you know right uh -huh. being confused and then you could roll in by rolling this around into the different expressions it was really cool what you got a hang of it. Then also on the joystick, this was always eye blinks. This middle was brows. And this was something like eyes wide or so. No, this is eyes wide, eyes blink. Then the brows. I always wanted the brows to be different so you could do this. Because this is such a great look. It, when a puppet doesn't work, if you're ever going to have a puppet that doesn't work, and I worked on a lot of them that didn't work because I was not feature character other than baby, I always asked for brows because a character can be like this and then you go, <laughs> and the person in the head can go, and the eyebrow goes up and the one goes down and it starts to make. So as long as I could do this part, I was good. And there were times the control would bust and I would be doing it like this. Uh. So... So it was some crazy stuff. But as Charlene, the girl I did it opposite, she was claustrophobic and she could not function properly. So they pulled us both out of that character. And I thought I was oh. going to I thought I was going to be fired. I, I really did. I thought did that's it. Did you ever design the uh, all those pulleys and mechanisms? Because I see people that have blinking eyes and cheeks that rise and fall and eyebrows and stuff. Did you? It looks like a whole lot of engineering goes into that. It does. And because Brian would not allow us as performers to build, oh. never did that. But you may tell me I can't build, but you can't take the builder out of me. Right. And I understood with the builders that building is a very difficult process. And there were five dinosaurs demanding these mechanics, keep them up and running. And so anytime I had a background character, I would not pressure them. So the guy who did dinosaurs, the chief engineer and, and builder was John Criswell, a brilliant man. And John was running around with his team trying to make sure that mom, Charlene, Robbie, and, and dad, and baby were all functioning the way they're supposed to. And if so, they were the five, so they were constantly needing attention. Okay. So you're a background character 
And now you're sitting here complaining because your character doesn't work. And the builders would go, seriously, this is a background character. Uh, so I would turn to John and say, the jaw isn't working. But wait, wire it shut. I'll blink the eyes and move the eyebrows. And the guy in the suit will do the rest. We're just walking through the background. And then on the headset, I'd tell the actor who's in the suit, it's on you, man. I'm going to blink the eyes, move the eyebrows. You give it some attitude. And they would do okay. it. And it looked fine. Now, when you watch dinosaurs, you should look at some of these background characters because you will see. I do. You'll, you'll see how their mouths might not work, and it could be because it's been wired shut. Oh. oh you know, okay. because they didn't work. And I wasn't about to push a mechanic. And as a result, Brian calls me on the carpet and tells me I have no ambition. Well, y'all know <laughs> better than that. <laughs> But I was Team Baby Sinclair. Team Baby Sinclair was the best character of all of them, in my opinion. Oh, and I was fun. Baby's Arms. Baby's Arms was the best job. Many people think it was the face, but <laughs> it was the arms. The arms got to do all the fun stuff. Rip up books. I got to hit Michael Eisner in the head. I had all this fun, exciting stuff that I got to do, and I loved being that 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 baby character and i didn't want to jeopardize that i did music videos we did commercials and we did the show so and we were the one they always asked to be a part of this we did photo shoots this character was like number one and i wasn't about to not be a part of it so so brian said don't you watch your own character i was like hell no <laughs> and, they, and he was like everyone else wants it why don't you and i said before you came to town meaning east coast to the west coast I played always the lead in puppets. I would audition and they always gave me the lead. Well, you watch leads. Once in a while, you get a really cool lead character that as an actor, you can sink your teeth into. Sling Blade comes to mind, mm -hmm. okay? That's an amazing lead character. I can't even recognize Billy Bob Thornton. I've seen it a million times. I keep trying to find him in there. He isn't in there. Yeah. And that <laughs> character is amazing. But a I lot reckon. of times, a lot of times characters uh the characters are yeah. characters are boring lead characters are boring and and they and, and one of the reasons i think is because they have to carry the show you know a lot of these lead characters are just not as interesting as the side characters unless they're featured in a way that they are you know and so i was i would see all these characters around me who are so much more interesting than the character i was playing as a lead and i'd say you know what i want to be i want to be a character actress because they have all the fun. They get to do the silly, crazy stuff. And being the lead is a lot of responsibility. I remember that William Shatner said that a lot of people said he wasn't a good, he was, he was never a party guy. He never hung out with the rest of the cast. And he said, I was on in every scene during the Star Treks. Everyone. I had to carry the show. There was no time for me to socialize. I wanted to. But I just couldn't. I mm. had to carry the show. And that's where you'll find with a lot of these people who are the lead characters. If you think about it, the fun characters. Look at Cheers. You know, the Whoa. mailman. Or the other, you know, the people. Cliff, I mean, Norm, Woody. Norm, exactly. yeah. Woody. Cliff, not Clayman. Ted. Sam, Diane. <laughs> yeah, not, not Ted. No, he was cool, but he wasn't the real interesting one. Yeah. So no. he had to carry the show. He was the lead. He's the straight man to their funny. So there's nothing wrong with being a lead. But for me, I wanted to be the character. So I said to Brian, I'm so happy being Team Baby and assisting with Team Baby. I don't want anything else because I've been doing puppets since I was, you know, I got cast in my first puppet show at 20 years old. Wow. So, so I said, you know. And here's the weird thing that happened to me the other day. I got a call from somebody who said, I was watching Renegade. Do you know the show Renegade? Yeah. <laughs> you but may is that not. More Lorenzo Lamas? Lorenzo yes, Lamas. And it's yeah, okay. really old. Yeah. <laughs> so am I, apparently. It's really old. <laughs> it's really old. <laughs> well, whoever owns that show did some digging and they re they resurrected a, a body and they rejuvenated, reanimated this show. Oh dear. I know this because my residual check, which is a royalty oh. check for doing the film, was seriously guys, seven cents forever. <laughs> 
it was more expensive to send me the check <laughs> and do the check than it was the you see what i'm saying yeah but the yeah, other yeah. day i got a check for 15 dollars and i went what <laughs> And Something I happened. got a call the other day and my friend said, I was watching Renegade the other day and your name was in the credits. And I said, oh, my Lord. I mean, this is an ancient show. I, I do the voice of a parrot. <laughs> so that's that's my my claim to fame is I'm the voice of the parrot. <laughs> but uh, it's hilarious. It's just wait, wait. hilarious. Speaking of cool and unique experiences like that, one thing that Paul, Mickey, and I have in common is, is our love. For Rick Baker. And ah. I remember you had a story you told us off the air last time about Rick Baker and something you made specifically for him. I mean, look at that. Okay. This is, you know, he's the God, right? I mean, everybody on he is in Hollywood. The guy. He's the guy. Now, yes. I know he's retired, but yes. I'd love to hear your, your story about your, what you made for Rick. Well, well, Rick Baker, here's the thing. Okay. I saw Star Wars 181 times. I don't know if I mentioned this to you. No, but okay. Right. I cut class. I know I shouldn't be telling the young people this, but I cut class to go <laughs> see Star Wars. I cut class to see Star Wars. Okay, I'd been waiting. I, my my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, said we got to go check out Star Wars, and we cut class, and we actually walked into the Chinese theater in Hollywood, no waiting, and saw this movie. By that night, when I went back to see it again, I couldn't get near the Chinese theater, let alone see this movie again. Oh, my God. Yeah. So I would get up every morning, and I would pay to go to the theater, but I had a bag with me. At that time, you could have bags with you. And I had a change of clothes. Actually, about six to eight changes of clothes. And I stayed all day in the theater. I would hide in the bathroom, change my hair, change my clothes, change my look, so that I could watch this film. It was so important to me to, to see this film because the room stretched for me. Um, I, had, I had known I was going to have a career in art, acting, and puppets, but at yet the door had not revealed itself to me. So I knew, oh man, I just knew when I saw Star Wars, this was it. So I could not get enough of it. I kept watching it and watching it and watching it and watching it. And... Uh, I got caught on my 90, no, on my 67th viewing. Hmm. I got caught. And the manager of the theater called me up to his office and he said, young lady, you've been cheating. And I went, uh, he says, you have been sneaking in here. And I said, mm. and he said, uh, you know how I know? And I said, how? And he said, there was a grid he was upstairs at the Chinese theater and you could see people going in and out of the restroom. And he said, I kept seeing this woman walk out. And he said, you know how I caught you? And I said, how? And he said, your handbag. And I was like, oh, <laughs> darn it. <laughs> you know, busted. And he was like, why is this so important to you? Why do you have to see this movie? And I just went on and on about how this was my destiny, that I was going to be uh, an artist for the film industry, that I was going to do voices for the film industry, that I was going to do this and I was going to do that. And it actually made him sit back in his chair. And then I said, let me prove it to you. Let me show you what I mean. Let me let me illustrate what I'm talking about. And I threw open my pad, much like Michael has. And I had sketched uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. I had sketched Mark Hamill as Luke. I had sketched uh, uh, Harrison Ford, I had done a Stormtrooper, I had done the wiki, and then I had written down every name in the credits. Every single name in the credits I wrote down, because back then there was no Google, there right. was no uh, uh, way to get it except for to look in a newspaper. There was no computers in 1977, just so you know, there were no computers. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's not me complaining, it's just those are the facts, Jack. There was no computer, yeah. so I had to look hey, inside. If there was, you couldn't get near one. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> they were huge, too, right? I mean, I was, it, it's hilarious. It's just hilarious. But anyway, so I showed it to him, and he looked at me with big, round eyes, and he said, oh, my gosh, is this what you've been doing? And I said, yes. And he said, my goodness, why would you do all this? And I said, weren't you listening? <laughs> I'm going to do this for a living. I need to find out who I need to see to make this happen. And so he said, okay, 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 kid. All right, okay. What if I let you come and see the movie as often as you like? 
for free. And I was like, really? And, but on your hundredth viewing, I want to be able to tell the press and use you as a marketing campaign. And I said, deal. Oh, wow. And so that's what happened. Okay. Now the media made me look like an idiot. They didn't let, they didn't, they cut out everything that I said as far as, you know, what I was going to do. But I did these sketches. I was not deterred. And I started to comb the newspaper for where some of these people affiliated and associated with Star Wars were going to be. And at USC, Rick Baker was going to make an appearance. So I pull, I, I grabbed my portfolio and I went and I paid and I drove in my car, Vader one, that yep. was the license plate mm. that breathed. <laughs> and I ran over to the place and I watched the uh, presentation. And uh, at the end I sat and I waited. And I waited as everybody left and and Rick Baker was packing up. And finally, there was there were a few enough people that I said, uh, Mr. Baker. And he looked up and saw me at the back of the room. And I said, I have a question for you. And he said, you do? And I said, yes. And he said, what is it? And I said, how do I get to do, how do I get to break into the film industry? I want to do this. I want to do not necessarily what you're doing because what you're doing is makeup. I can do makeup, but I really want to do the puppets and I want to do the performing and I want to do the voices and stuff. And he says, well, the first thing you need to have kid is a portfolio. And I picked up my portfolio and I opened it up and I said like this. <laughs> and he went, Holy crap. And he's looking through it going, Oh my, Oh my, Oh my, what the heck? And I was like, my dad always said to photograph everything that I do. So I did. And he was like, okay, okay. And he took my phone number and he said, you just keep doing what you're doing. And then one day uh, I got a phone call and I didn't get to work with him, but he put me together with a guy named Lane Liska, which did a lot of um, Star Wars stuff. And he introduced me to Lance Anderson, who later I worked with on Captain EO with Michael Jackson. And I started to be in the presence of these people and I was building creatures for them and with them. And the movies weren't necessarily good, but I, I built all these things with them and for them. And then I became an Imagineer and Rick Baker's studio was just down the street from there. And so when I was an Imagineer, we would have lunch at this little cafe in the middle and talk all the time. So we became these great friends and I kept saying, when are you gonna hire me? When are you gonna hire me? And he's like, well, I don't usually hire my friends. And I go, yeah, but I'm good. And he's like, and he's like, good to know, but we'll see. Okay, we'll see, we'll see. He always would tell me, we'll see. But he kept watching me. And then we had a mutual friend called Bob Burns, this amazing guy who's responsible for helping people. He all, he's also one of those people who can light your fire and make you move forward. Dennis Murin, uh, head of ILM, was going to be a dentist. His parents were dentists, so he was going to be a dentist. And then he met Bob Burns and became the effects guy that we all know and love. And thank God oh, he did. God. Rick Baker, at the age of 13, sent a mask to Bob Burns and asked him what he thought about it. And Bob encouraged him to continue. Rick Baker, young Rick Baker. Wow. Rick Baker later comes after winning several Academy Awards and sees that mask in Bob's museum and says, Bob, Jimmy Christmas, you got to get rid of that. And Bob says, oh, no, I don't. No, -uh. no, 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 you're not touching that. Because that teaches kids that, that they have the ability to go where you've been. Uh -huh. I show them where you were, and I show you where they've been, you've been, and I tell them about your awards. They know who you are. And Rick was like, oh, my gosh. So he sent him a Gorillas in the Mist mask and a Mighty Joe Young a mask that he had done for the those two films so that Bob could have the stages in the museum. Right. To you show know, the yeah, because he didn't want that mask to be the representation of this. That's so funny. It's so true, too. You look back at some of your old stuff and it's like, oh boy. I mean, he's he's a terrific man. And so finally, uh he was gonna retire several times, but he loves apes. And so uh he he would tell he told me the story of when he was in King Kong with uh Jessica Lang. He was the King Kong that climbs up the building. And he was no. really, he was really sick. 
he wasn't feeling well, and he kept saying that the that the head of Kong kept filling up with snot because he was really sick. He said it was not a fun experience, and I thought, yeah, that doesn't sound too fun actually. But then, you know, he just kept doing more stuff and cool stuff, as you all know. You love his work; he's amazing. Uh, lots of Academy Awards, and then Men in Black reaches out to Rick Baker. And I'm working for a little studio you may have you may not have known about, but you will when I tell you how it's affiliated. I went to work for a studio called K, K as in Kite, N as in Nancy, B as in Boy, K and B Studios. If you don't know who that is, it stands for Kurtzman, Nicotero, and Berger. And Kurtzman, I mean Nicotero, is Greg right here. Greg is the is the director of The Walking Dead. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. He's been directing The Walking Dead since the very beginning. <laughs> and he was building the zombies when there was a problem and they asked Greg he was directing second unit and they asked him if he could direct first and he said, "Yes." So here we're having lunch and he's he's helping me promote my book. He's been my friend for a long time. But I was building for him, and the first thing I built was a prehistoric ground sloth skeleton for the movie Relic. Oh, and wow. uh, I built two of them. I built a burning one and a non-burning one. <laughs> and so uh, rumor, word came to me that I they wanted me to audition for Men in Black. And so I went to Rick Baker's and auditioned for Men in Black. And Rick said, finally, we're going to get to work together. I said, I hope so. And then it was cast, and I wasn't called. And they called Rick. Rick Baker called K and B, and he said, "Where's Terry?" And they said, "What do you mean, where's Terry?" And they said, "I thought because she's one of the better puppeteers, you would be bringing her to set, so I didn't cast her as a puppeteer." And they said, "No, no, no. She's on another project. She's doing something else. We didn't cast her in that." And he goes, "Well, I need her here." And they were like. What? He says, yeah, I need her down here on Men in Black for a couple weeks. Can you spare her? Well, who's going to say no No to Rick Baker? Uh, right. Even if you are Greg Nicotero and Howard Berger. But, uh, but so I went on the set. And to this day, if you watch Men in Black 1, I have the biggest credit I have ever had in my entire life. And it's because Rick felt that I deserved that credit. But he pulled me in so that I could work with him on... Uh, Men in Black, and I did those tentacle characters, and I helped with the scrubbing bubbles and the worm guys and all that Good. fun stuff. And that was because Rick decided to to pull me in. And then Men in Black Two, he brought me back, and I got to play a a shark bounty hunter. And me and the suit performer made him too scary, so they cut a lot of scenes with him, which is too bad. I said, I thought that's what a bounty hunter is supposed to be. Yeah, he's right? like, Well, yeah, but you know, we changed our mind. So through the history, Rick and I have been doing stuff together for quite some time. And, uh, and uh, uh, working with him has been an absolute joy. And I, I know that when I was on Men in Black, he, he had done uh, the first Planet of the Apes. And I knew that some of those makeups were not his. And I said, what happened to the females in that film? And he said, the actresses wouldn't allow me to do the makeups I wanted to do, but the men were cool. And of course, those were some of the best makeups in, in oh, history, so good, you know, yeah. but the women looked ridiculous. And it, I don't know why you take a part if you're not going to let somebody really make it happen. But then it happens all through life. Captain EO, Angelica Houston wouldn't allow them to put the makeup on her face. It had to be grease paint. They wouldn't let her, she wouldn't no. have prosthetics on. So, so, you know, okay, whatever. I don't, you know, That's sometimes ridiculous. it's, good not to have a name, you know, because a name will say, oh, I'll do it. I like doing it, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. But Rick is a great guy. And we just uh, saw each other the other, we, we saw each other uh, just before the pandemic because he's got a book out that costs a few hundred yes. dollars. And uh, I told hey, him. Oh, I him, have it. I got it as a birthday present. I told him I'm going to get it and that right. he needs to sign it. You know, when I went to apply to do sculptures for uh, Disneyland, I took my husband with me and we went down to Disneyland. I was going to have a meeting to, to introduce my figurines to Disneyland, the park, to be an artist represented in the park. 
And we ran over to the little, it's not there anymore, but the little ranch restaurant that's outdoors. And my husband turned and said, oh my God, Rick Baker's sitting over there. And I was like, oh yeah, you want to meet him? And my husband just about had kittens. Yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah. So we got our food and I said, hey, Rick. And he says, Terry, what's up? And I said, my husband really admires your work. Do you mind if we join you for a bit? He'd like to meet you. And Rick was like, sure. Aww. So then I said, I've got to go. But if you're all right, Rick, would you mind, you know, carrying on talking with my husband? Because I've got to go do this interview with Disney. And uh, I'm sure he'd like to stay in chat if you don't mind. He was like, no, no, I don't mind. So my husband got to sit and chat with Rick Baker while I went and did my interview. And, and yeah. uh, you know, we meet up and he's on flipping cloud nine, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Guillermo del Toro asked me to build a sculpture for him. So I did a sculpture for Guillermo del Toro of the Pirates of the Caribbean. Hey, and uh, the pirate bed. And in the show, his show, he calls me. No, nah, he emailed me and he said, Terry, you've made the cut. Your sculpture will be going into LACMA. And I was like, oh my goodness. So I got to go to the opening and we were standing in line with Rick Baker and James Cameron. Wow. <laughs> Couple of no names. That's insane. <laughs> it was just so weird. But you know what made Terry happy is on the program, my name follows Ray Harryhausen's. So if you look uh, at the program, it says Ray Harryhausen and then Terry Hart. <laughs> wow. That's a nice name to follow right there. Oh my goodness. So I, you know, it was just, it's just, the life is surreal. The life is so, so wonderful, so great. But I just kept going through doors and I could really encourage everyone to do the same, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, these stories just get better and better every time. <laughs> That's Michael, a Michael time. Jackson, Michael Jackson I, I told him my favorite actress was Elizabeth Taylor. And a week later, Elizabeth Taylor was reaching out to me saying, Michael thinks you're very talented. And I was like, is this really? <laughs> wow, really? Oh, my, oh my God. So that means we have, we, have one, we have one degree of separation from both Liz Taylor and Michael Jackson now. This is exactly what we were thinking. So Right. It's, 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 just, it's just amazing. She, she uh, had me do a pumpkin for her before she passed, and I did a pumpkin for her. I've done pumpkins for The Ellen Show, and I've done pumpkins oh, wow. for Desperate Housewives, and uh, True Blood I did a pumpkin for. And, and, Love uh, that show. I, I, I don't know if I told you the story of it, and it's funny because Ray, Ray Villafane, of course, I call him the pumpkin king. Mm -hmm. But uh, but there's a lot of sculptors out there that are very, very good. And I know that he looked at me sideways for a while because he's like, well, what have you done? And I said, this show, this show, this show, this show. You know, and it, and it was just because people saw my work and they would look at it and they'd go, hey. And uh, it was great to meet him. I have the... Uh, the positioning, if you will, that I judged him, and I and and that, right. that really made me That's feel right. good. Yeah, I was a judge on the on his second when he was defending his title, and uh, and I think that's why they they well I asked I said I want to be a judge, but I think that's why they bring me back because I was born in Hollywood, so one of the best places to see actors is to go to the unemployment office when I was a kid. So <laughs> so honestly. I don't get too in awe. I don't go fan because they're colleagues of mine. Um, right. But I do yeah. know that they like to hear, people like to hear that their work is good by someone who genuinely believes it's good. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. So, I mean, Captain EO was amazing. Not only was Michael Jackson there, but George Lucas was there. Wow. Let's talk about a fact that a movie you watch as a kid and it changes your life. That's what Star Wars did for me. And... Later, full circle, I get to tell George Lucas just how much it means to me. That's and not cool. just like in an audience where you stand up and you say, that really was great. But sitting on the steps of the Captain EO set and actually having a full-on conversation. And that these are things great. that are super special to me. Full-on oh conversations yeah. with Michael Jackson. Full-on conversations with Elizabeth Taylor. Full-on conversations with Sidney Poitier full on conversations and even being punked 
by Whoopi Goldberg. I've done three films with her. <laughs> that little stinker. She is so funny. And the movies weren't great, but the company was awesome. Okay, the movies weren't that good, but oh, the company was wonderful. She was a, a she is a, a lovely lady. And and I say, if you don't have an attitude or an opinion, you know, come on, don't don't sail, don't don't walk in the middle of the street. We all know what Mi Miyagi said: left side safe, right side safe, middle squish. So so don't play the middle. One or the other, and, and and stand by what you feel, and that was what that's Whoopi. That's always been Whoopi, and being with her was such a was was a, you know all these people. It was a lovely experience because they were they were your colleagues. You're sitting there, you know, having a break, and you'd say, you know, what's it like to you know? Can I ask you a question? You know, what's right. it like? Well, the, the name we get the name we get to drop is Terry Harden. That's, oh, that's you're so name. sweet. That's the you're name so we sweet. get to drop. I appreciate that. Know. I, 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 I know we're I know we're past time, Mickey. I before before I before I, I'd be remiss. I haven't seen a damn thing you've done. Well, you've got to kind of see us carve away. What what have you what have you yeah, done, Mickey? Mickey? Oh, yeah. oh Mickey, you, I saw flashes. You, I saw flashes of it, baby. It looked good to me. All right, let's take a look. Okay. <laughs> let's see your alien. So uh, it's funny because uh, well, with all my extra hair now, um, it's actually motivated me to train. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I now. love it. <laughs> yeah, so I I, I was uh, kind of debating to whether going futuristic. Instead, I went heavy metal. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so yeah, I like so. It. Um, oh my god. So, yeah, I, I I mean, I said, I, it's yeah, it's it's funny how um you know, I was just I was just saying a hundred minutes uh, have gone by. We, I mean, it went by in an instant. Um, and just doodling Very... and and doing what you guys are doing. Let's let's see some of your stuff. Let's let's see. So Matt, what do you what do you what are you doing? Oh, all right. So um, if I can get the lighting correct here, see if I can move it. That's around. the hardest so, part, isn't it? I know. Oh, it's always so, uh, so, I love so the this, painting. This guy was a really big. Had a really big. Here, here's here's how he started, right? With a big stem on top. But so here, turn him over. So he's got. I'm, I'm working on his maniacal smile at this point. I love it. Uh, kind, of, kind of an underbite. Yeah, some, and then he's got he's got lots of these like crazy veins pulsing through his head. I like it. Gonna, I don't think that the no, the light's showing it. No, yeah, it okay. is. It looks it looks good. But again, you're going to be a dental hygienist for a while working. I, I got a lot. Yeah, he's got he's got some teeth. <laughs> he's going to have some uh, some dental work going on here. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, and then wanted to have one eye slightly closed and the other. So I got I got a lot of work still to do. But um, yeah, he's. He's pretty maniacal, so to speak. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So far. Let's, it is. Let's it see, looks uh... good. Oh, I love this because <laughs> he's upside down. <laughs> yeah. I was, work I was working on the teeth, and it just yeah. seemed to work on them that way. But I like well, it. So eventually. Oh, oh he looks cool. really good. He looks really good, Paul. <laughs> the expression is actually giving me a headache, so I think I'm on the right path. Like, I feel like he's, yeah. That's yeah, looks maniacal. Yeah. Right? Long he way to a, go. Long he looks a little to hungry too. He does. <laughs> he does. <laughs> Maybe that's why he's maniacal. He might calm down if he might calm down a little bit if you feed him. But be careful because if he eats people, you're in trouble. It's a good. Yeah, give, him looks, a those, give him a pair of those. Give him a pair of those Nike shoes with the blood in them. He'll eat those. <laughs> oh, the, new, the, sat the satanic ones, right? The, the, the satanic the hottest, ones. The hottest shoe on the planet, or oh, uh, it's just a thousand dollars a pair or something because it has a drop of blood in it. We were talking about is that safe? Um, you know, what if that blood has? You know, how do you make sure it's safe to have that with that blood in there? And oh my gosh, just the just craziness. That is yeah, just a crazy shoe. Hey, and you know, Nike is like, that's not our brand, buddy. You're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> you know. oh, so Crazy funny. world. Oh, you know. Crazy well, world. well, Terry, uh, I mean, at, at each time we have you on, we we never get to talk enough about the things you've done. You have so much more. And I, I said I have more on my slide. Uh, like, I wanted to talk more about Captain EO. I wanted to talk about um, Waylon Flowers. Uh, I mean, oh, like, yeah. Make, make little notes. You know, just make little notes and then pin it to that board with all those stickers or whatever you got back there. Yeah, and then definitely. Just you can pull it down and and then every Mondays and Fridays I do a live broadcast on Facebook and YouTube. On Fridays it's an Ask Me Anything at nine twenty five in the morning. Just Google Terry Harden and dig through all of that, but you'll find it or go to YouTube and and Terry Harden. 
Um, but uh, that's a great place to, to start to ask questions. And I talk about the same things or, or learn more. Or uh, I've been walking people through the painting. I've been walking people through a little bit of the, of the sculpting and just saying, you know, move forward and do it because, you know, you want to. Uh, before I go, I should really tell you that there's a, there's a, a show I've been, I just love. I, I get to see screeners and vote for the Screen Actors Guild, which is the acting division. And uh, one of the best shows I've seen all year is Ted Lasso. And I, I didn't really know what it was, so I avoided it. But it's such a great show. And there's a scene where he says, you know, for years, I used to, what you know, Walt Whitman said, uh, be curious, not judge. And he said, I always realized that people were always judging me. And I think as artists, you're always judged as people. If you're a little bit off or a little bit weird or a little bit different, they're always judging you. Yeah. They're That's not curious about you. In fact, you can play a game where they'll tell you all about themselves, but never ask you anything about yourself. And you walk away and you kind of giggle, you know, and, and you say, if they yeah. Google me, they're going to be like, whoa, she never mentioned it because I'm not going to mention it if you don't ask. But the point is, as he said, he realized it didn't have anything to do with him. It didn't have anything to do with you. It was their their situation. They thought they knew everything. And so they missed an opportunity to see this golden person, this wonderful uh, creative person, uh, another person that might be a kindred spirit to what they're doing. And uh, it's a great show. And I, I live by that. I live by that. Be curious, not judgmental. There's too much judgment in the world and you it, it, it's a door that closes you always want to make a door open not close right so uh unless some of those aliens are out there they may be closed yeah. but <laughs> and it has jason sudeikis in it who is yeah. one of the funniest people on the planet yeah so for sure. I, I i have to be honest with you i had not seen him i did not know him he is so but funny. i fell in love with him and I fell in love with a lot of people on that show. They are all so very special. And after the first two shows, or it's the first five minutes of the first show, they had signed for three seasons. Wow. It was that Whoa. good. It was that good. So we now so, we now have another binge watch show to no, no. it's <laughs> only it's only one season right now. Yeah. Oh, thank it's God. first season just dropped. It's the it, it's just, but it's 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 the uh, it's so hot, and unfortunately, right now I think you can only see it on like Apple Plus. But but oh. it's great. It's great. Yeah. So when it comes, you guys got to see it. It's so special. Great, another streaming service I now have to sign up for. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm like, no, just come and see it with me. You know, I hope you got. We can get together sometime, and I'll bring it with me, or I'll show you because I got oh, I DVDs. That would be. That would be I would love that. That would be fantastic. Yeah. So this is where you can see us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch. Uh, Matt, did you have anything that you wanted to promote? Yeah, there's a there's there's a wonderful woman named uh, Terry Hardit, and if you <laughs> aren't following her, I've heard of her, please do, <laughs> please do. Yeah, we just love her and love her work, and uh, and just are in awe that she chose to be on our show, and and couldn't thank her enough. Oh, I'm yeah. more than happy to do it a million times. So uh, whenever you, whenever you're you're for you, guess, you can do just like on. Paul did. Reach out and go. But Paul, if I don't haven't gotten you, given you my number, you got to be able to text me and go, yo, we lost our guest. You want to come on? Because I probably could. So anytime. <laughs> awesome. you just, Terry, yeah, anytime. I will. I will do that. I, I promise you I will do that. Paul, right. do you have anything that you want to promote? Uh, yeah, I'll just go with what Matt said and make sure you tune in to Terry on the Facebook Live. And right next to her name right there, it says Terry Harden Legend right there. Give it a like and a follow and all that good stuff. And make sure you stay tuned because she'll be back. Nikki's taking notes right now so we can hit those hot points. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And don't hesitate to ask questions, all kinds of questions I get. I was talking to Portugal the other girl, day. The girl was so nervous. It was adorable. You oh. know, I love to talk to young people. She was so scared. She's like, this is my first interview. I go, you got this. <laughs> Just breathe. That's it. All you got to do. Ask me the question and let me run. <laughs> That's it. Well, awesome. Well, you can see Carvers and Creators next Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific. Nine, oh, right? It's. I'm sorry. What am I saying? I'm, that's my baseball show. I keep on uh, getting those mixed up. 4, <laughs> oh, uh, 4 p.m. Pacific. 
and 7 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much again. We'll see you next week. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Terry. Good night. Thank you, Terry. Good night, everybody.